connect with us and follow us on our um, YouTube channel and also um, Facebook and sorry, Facebook and uh, LinkedIn. Uh, and also you can consult our um, um, uh, web page on, uh, on internet. And now it's time to uh, introduce the speaker from today. So uh, the webinar will be, uh, there will be a first part of the webinar uh, and then we will have the question and answer session. So I ask all of you to um, uh, put your question in the chat. And then after that, uh, after the end of the webinar, um, the speaker will answer to all uh, your question. Uh, the webinar is recorded, so you will find also the recording on uh, our YouTube channel in a couple of weeks. And um, the speaker of today is Giulio. So uh, Giulio uh, started his career in uh, uh, Polytechnic in Milano, where he, uh, he he's award, has awarded his uh, PhD and is now um, an untenured assistant professor there. Uh, is an expert of uh, existing reinforced concrete bridges and uh, both for the assessment, the monitoring, and also the maintenance, but he has also large expertise with composite materials for the retrofit of existing structures, both FRCM system, um, SFRCM, ultra high performance fiber reinforced system and composites, and also uh, expertise in the conservation of modern concrete, uh, concrete architecture. So thank you, Julio, for being here with us today, talking about existing reinforced concrete bridges, palaces or prisons, and the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Marta, for your nice introduction, and thank you also for the work that you and, uh, and the board are doing for the YMG, the Italian YMG. Okay, so let me share the screen. Okay, and you should all, all see my presentation. So let me put it in this mode. Okay, so welcome everybody. Welcome to all the attendees of this webinar and thank you for your time. Today, I will start my presentation uh, with a question. And the question is again, why palaces and prisons? And I started with this slide because I think I owe you an explanation about this title. So on the left side of the screen, you see the interior of the Doge's Palace in Venice, while on the right, you see the very unwelcoming corridor of the dungeons of the new state prisons in Venice. And actually these two spaces are connected by a small stone masonry bridge, which is called Bridge of Sighs. And this name probably came from Lord Byron, which is the English poem who spent three years of his life in Venice. And in one of these poems, he wrote, I stood in Venice on the bridge of Sighs, a palace and a prison on each hand. And here he was probably thinking about the prisoners leaving the palace in which they had the trial and then walking through the bridge and seeing the Venice Lagoon for the last time for those little windows. And I took this very powerful image as a metaphor of the conflicting feelings that are moved by existing or reinforced concrete bridges, especially in, uh, in the past years and in the past decade. Uh, throughout my presentation, you will see some small tags uh, which we recall to a palace, a prison, or an average house, which is taken as the neutral position. And this actually represents uh, some uh, positive, negative, uh, or neutral aspects uh, about reinforced concrete uh, used in uh, reinforced concrete bridges. The neutral position is taken because in most, uh, or in many cases, let's say, we don't have enough evidences to uh, reach uh, or to draw some sound conclusions about the idea that concrete is a material which uh, cannot be effectively employed anymore in the construction of uh, such kind of uh, bridges and structures and elements. Okay, so negative feelings about reinforced concrete uh, um, were certainly felt in Italy in over the past decade because we experienced a series of collapses of bridge structures. And in this slide, I'm uh, reporting a timeline covering uh, the last eight years uh, in which uh, I tried to point out with those, those small red dots, uh, all the cases in which we had structural failure associated to bridges. This is certainly not representative of the overall bridge collapses because uh, um, in some cases we don't have any kind of fatality or if the collapse uh, is due 
generally to some environmental actions, maybe uh, the news is not shared within, uh, within the whole country. But the first one uh, that I want to comment uh, is the collapse of the Anone overpass. So this occurred in 2016. Uh, and I know this bridge quite well because my supervisor here at Politecnico, Professor Marco Di Prisco, was uh, appointed as uh, an advisor, a technical advisor, by the prosecutor within, uh, in this case, within the trial. And he was asked to explain uh, the causes of this collapse uh, by running uh, several experimental investigations and also some structural analysis on the bridge. And at the bottom of this slide, you see a series of small pictures uh, in which uh, you can find uh, the situation of the Gerber saddle that triggered the collapse of this bridge uh, right before the failure. And you can see that this bridge was severely um, degraded and also cracked at this point. And uh, in the second image, you see a frame of the collapse video, while in the third one, a sectional analysis on uh, reinforcement that was extracted from the structure and proved that almost 70% of the original section was lost due to corrosion phenomena, which were again accelerated by the cracking state of these type of elements. The last one is uh, one of the Gerber saddle that uh, was paired by the, the failure of the, the, the deck of the bridge and then uh, was cut and then moved to our laboratories here in Lecco and then tested to assess the capacity of this uh, of these element because in some situation you need to go back to the original configuration understand uh, which was the arrangement of the reinforcement uh, and also the capacity after several years of age because this failed uh, about, uh, let's say, 70 years uh, uh, after construction. The second case, which was, uh, um, let's say, um, really surprising, uh, occurred in 2017 uh, in Fossano. And this was a bridge of uh, about 30 years of age, so not a very old one, which failed basically just under its uh, self-weight, so without uh, any kind of exceptional load on it. And the failure here is probably due to, uh, again, the corrosion of some uh, tendons and some reinforcement. Keep in mind uh, that I put here a kind of disclaimer note uh, because most uh, um, of the explanations of the failures that I'm presenting in these uh, slides uh, are the most accredited causes of collapse, but some uh, uh, failures are still under investigations uh, and also under trial. So uh, you should keep this uh, in mind. The next case, which was certainly the most shocking over the past decade, was the collapse of the bridge in Genova. So this is the Polcevera Bridge, it was originally designed by Riccardo Morandi, and in the following, I will go back to this bridge. And this failed, uh, causing uh, 43 deaths, and the failure, again, is probably due to erosion, aging of the structure, and deterioration of some tendons and pre-stress tendons or post-tensioning systems that were employed in the stays of this system. Going um, or focusing on the past two years, uh, we have two cases that are worth mentioning. The first one is the Albiano Bridge, which collapsed probably due to a slow uh, landslide, which uh, insisted on one abutment of the bridge, uh, causing progressive uh, vertical displacement, uh, of the foundation and finally the global collapse of the structure. And then uh, the last one, uh, the very last one uh, at the end of 2020 was the collapse of the bridge uh, of Romagnano. Uh, no fatalities here, but the failure which uh, occurred right after a very exceptional event uh, in terms of hydraulic event in this case. So by analyzing uh, this time series of collapses, we, can, uh, we could conclude that most of the recent failures were observed in reinforced concrete or pre-stress concrete bridges. And so this might be a negative observation about this kind of material. But then we can assume at least a neutral position because we know that more than 50% of Italian bridge stock is made of reinforced concrete or pre-stress concrete because this was a material traditionally used due to its cheapness uh, and also due to the advancement of technology, for instance, of pre-stress concrete uh, after World War II. Uh, we can also assume maybe a positive feeling about reinforced concrete if we consider that a large share, about 80% of the Italian bridges was built before the 1950s and 60s. So it means that we have a very 
all the stock of infrastructures. And so some bridges that are collapsing now that can exhibit some deficiency in the structural performances actually already exceeded that their expected service life. And so they performed quite good over a sufficient amount of time, but now the problem is mainly associated to the maintenance of the bridge. But is that, this just an Italian problem? This is a question that one should, should ask. So because it, I, sh I have shown a series of collapses in Italy, which are very dense in time over a limited part time span. But in this slide, I'm sharing with you some results that were presented in an event here in Lecco by Philip Yen, who is a chief engineer at the Federal Highway Administration of the United States. And the FHWA uh, has in charge more than uh, 600,000 highway bridges in the US uh, distributed over more than 4 million miles of roads. And uh, over a time span of roughly 30 years, uh, they had more than 1,000 bridge failures. So it's a, it's a huge number if you think about it. And um, in, the, in the bottom diagram, you also see the distribution uh, of these uh, US highway bridges by age and condition, uh, which was uh, assessed uh, by the Federal Highway Administration. And uh, you see that the stock of the US bridges is not as old as the Italian one for obvious uh, historical reasons, but all these uh, parts which are represented, uh, let me just put here maybe the pointer so it's easier. So all this portion here in light gray actually represents bridges which are considered structurally deficient. And each of these is about 10,000 bridges if you look at the scale. So we have a very large number of infrastructures which is considered substandard. So in 2001, about 30% of American bridges were actually considered not sufficient in terms of functional or structural performances. If we move now to the causes or typical causes of collapse, again, uh, referred to these uh, thousand collapses in the United States, you can see that the vulnerability towards some natural events, uh, mainly uh, hydraulic events like flood or scour is dominant uh, over the other causes. So flood uh, is due to large volumes of water insisting on the bridge, while the scour is a phenomena that um, implies uh, the removal of some soil beneath the foundation and so the loss of equilibrium of the global system, of the pier and then of the global system. Another uh, big uh, uh, cause of collapse is the overload. So uh, load insisting on the bridge uh, and not compatible with the structural capacities. Uh, then the collision, we can have uh, oversized ships or some oversight vehicles uh, crossing the bridge, uh, which might cause uh, again, uh, some collapses. And then we see that the degradation here counts about 7%, 7 of uh, the collapses documented in the United States. I also included here, uh, and I referenced uh, this uh, heavily cited paper from 2003, in which, uh, again, referring to the United States stocks, uh, the authors uh, analyzed uh, 500 uh, failures uh, of bridges uh, which failed uh, over a time span of 11 years uh, in the US. So from 1989 to 2000. And we can observe here then about 50% of total bridge failures was associated to a steel structure. So this is completely different uh, data from the one that we commented about the Italian situation. And then about 10% of, uh, of this sample of bridges uh, was associated to concrete uh, structures. So a very limited uh, number if compared uh, again to what we discussed about Italy. So we might conclude that this is good news for reinforced concrete, but maybe also in this case, it's better just to assume a neutral position because uh, we should always refer this data to the context. So we know that in the United States, steel bridges uh, are much more common uh, than in other places uh, of the world. So. Um, what we can discuss here is what happened after some uh, failure events. Uh, so in Italy, most uh, of the reinforced concrete or pre-stress concrete bridge failures were followed by the substitution of the original structures with a new steel-based structure. And you see some examples. So this one uh, is the new unknown overpass, which was uh, substituted, as you can see, 
with the uh, anti-corrosion steel uh, structure. Then we have uh, the, the case uh, on the right, uh, which uh, is um, the, the viaduct that I presented you before. And again, the deck was substituted with a steel system. And at the bottom, you see two pictures uh, of the new bridge in Genova. So also this bridge, uh, which was, uh, uh, let's say, uh, also this, this connection, which was ensured by the Morandi Bridge was substituted uh, with a steel solution, at least the, the deck. So you see a number of piers, which are of course made of reinforced concrete. And then we have the deck, which is all made of steel. In this picture, you see the load test that was conducted before the opening of this bridge, which was built very fast. It took just one year to uh, completely uh, finalize the works uh, of this uh, construction. So, this choice uh, of substituting uh, an existing uh, reinforced concrete structure, which also may be uh, exhibited some failures or some deficiency with a steel one is always a good choice. And again, here I put a question because uh, I wanted to refer firstly uh, to the Viadotto Polcevera, so the Viaduct in Genova by Riccardo Morandi. This is a bridge uh, that was uh, demolished or at least the remaining and the surviving parts of the bridge were demolished in August uh, 2019, about one year after the initial failure. And um, this, uh, this thing uh, was, uh, was actually uh, criticized uh, in Italy by, by many sectors and many people because this bridge was representing a masterpiece of Italian engineering. And you see how this bridge was welcomed also on national newspapers at the time of the opening. And this is a plus for reinforced concrete because this type of structure, which such a clever and sophisticated idea about the space, which comprise two orders of different tendons, post-tensioning systems, able to ensure also the, the complete absence of cracking in this space during the service life of the bridge and under variable load, um, was considered a pioneer application of pre-stress concrete technology. So it's pioneer because uh, actually the technology of pre-stress concrete uh, was effectively developed uh, only after the Second World War. Because before of that, it was imagined, that it, it was conceived, but the technology of steel was not uh, sufficient uh, to be able to produce some materials uh, characterized by sufficiently wide uh, elastic range uh, able to, um, let's say, ensure sufficient performances uh, also when the pre-stress losses are considered and introducing the materials. So even though this was uh, a masterpiece, of course, of Italian engineering, it is true that since uh, the 1970s, uh, this bridge uh, uh, shown uh, significant creep effects uh, and also some uh, uh, initial corrosion of the stays tendons uh, and also of some metal parts which were constituting the structure. But we also, and we always need to keep in mind uh, the role of the level of knowledge and technology of the time of construction. In the following, uh, I will show you uh, some, uh, some sentences uh, from Riccardo Morandi, from those that we can understand that the knowledge of the structure was, uh, was very good, but the knowledge of the material was limited because uh, it was before uh, 50, 70 uh, years of research. So the knowledge that we have nowadays is different from the knowledge that engineers had several years ago. But what is important to keep in mind is that these kind of structures also have a cultural value. And so sometimes uh, it's maybe a pity to, uh, to, to lose them forever as it happened for the Viadotto Polcevera, even though the choices and the political, mainly political choices uh, were forced by the need to substitute in an urgent way and in a very speedy way, uh, the former bridge with the new structure connecting the city of Genova. Uh, speaking of cultural value, I just wanted to mention very fast, this is just a spot uh, about the Falling Water. So Falling Water is a national US monument. Uh, it's a very famous house uh, and it's an architectural masterpiece by Frank Lloyd Wright. And this was uh, constructed in the 1930s. And this is also a pioneer application of reinforced concrete uh, because of the very large spans uh, of these balconies, which are made with reinforced concrete, which uh, you know, was uh, developed uh, a few years before the construction or a few decades before the construction. 
so uh, the nice story about this building is that this building was born uh, with very severe structural problems. Since the very beginning, uh, since the removal of the formworks, uh, uh, these balconies exhibited some uh, very large displacements of about, uh, if I'm not wrong, something about seven, eight centimeters uh, of vertical displacement uh, at the removal uh, of the formworks. So over time, uh, the situation worsened continuously, uh, some cracks appeared. And since this is a national monument, and since uh, this has a very important cultural uh, value, um, it was promoted uh, a restoration activity of this structure. And the engineers that worked on this uh, system actually went through the original designs and discovered that since uh, uh, the architect took a lot of time to think about this structure and left uh, very few days for the structural design of people working in his firm. At the end, the engineers forgot this type of reinforcement here. So you see this dashed line here. And actually, if you think to this balcony, this is a cantilever structure, and this is the section characterized by the maximum negative bending moment. So uh, due to the absence of this reinforcement, uh, actually this top balcony was facing a possible risk of failure. And how did it ensure equilibrium? Equilibrium was ensured by some tiny columns made of steel, which were encased inside the window framing. So you can barely see them. But you see here that the window framing is a little bit larger. And so inside here, they had some small columns which were just enough to avoid the problems of buckling at this point. So the loads were redistributed and then, um, let's say, deviated into the, the bottom balcony and then back to the wall. So this was going to collapse. So it was a really a dangerous situation. And so at some point, they decided to, to remove the, the flooring system and remove all the stones of the floor and then introduce and employ new technology as the external pre-stressing, which was not available at the time of construction to uh, increase the level of safety of this system, uh, also respecting uh, the appearance uh, and also preserving the cultural value. So it's something that maybe we should bear in mind also when you are thinking about some engineering structures, which might not have uh, such a wide architectural value, but still are, uh, let's say a testimony of, uh, of the advancement of engineering, the advancement of technology. Going back to the Viadotto Polcevera, I, I told you before that I went through this paper by Riccardo Morandi, and this paper was published in 1979, so about 11, 12 years uh, after the opening uh, of the Polcevera Viaduct. And if you read this paper, you will understand that he was uh, fully aware of the situation of this bridge and also on the possible deterioration phenomena of concrete with some uh, simplification. So you see here that also the terms which are used uh, are not as refined as those that we use nowadays. But what he says inside this paper is that this type of structure, so all reinforced concrete structures and reinforced concrete bridges are subject to a slow deterioration because of the effect of movable loads and also the effect of environmental action. So this is something that deals with nature. Everything uh, gets old and so also concrete gets old. But then we have a second sentence in which uh, thinks that as the technique and technology for reinforced concrete and pre-stressed concrete will become more sophisticated, uh, it would have been required to provide a careful observation of the structure over time uh, and also the possible intervention with some remedial works uh, that should be carried out quickly and properly. And we know from history and we know also from uh, the investigations uh, that maintenance was not ensured over time uh, in a quick and proper way in most of the times. So um, also he established the aggressiveness of the, of the uh, atmosphere which surrounds, surrounded this bridge. And this was due to the vicinity with, with the sea and also the presence of some pollution in the area. And at the end, something that plays a positive role for reinforced concrete is thinking about what would have been the maintenance cost instead of a structure made entirely of concrete. If instead of a structure entirely made of concrete, 
um, a steel solution uh, had been adopted, or at least a solution which was not able to contrast to the cracking of, uh, of concrete, uh, meaning the pre-stress concrete technology. So in this sense, uh, it was thinking about uh, the comparison uh, between the two materials and the idea that in such uh, aggressive environment, uh, also steel might have had some uh, very big problems. Uh, and he also discovered it himself uh, by inspecting the bridge. And after five years or so, since the opening, uh, some uh, metal parts, uh, some small plates were completely corroded. He also suggested to cover them uh, with some compounds. So thinking about steel bridges, uh, uh, it is worth mentioning the Golden Gate Bridge because uh, it is pretty known uh, that this bridge uh, is painted continuously. So they never stopped painting the bridge uh, since uh, its opening. And what I discovered, I didn't know, but I discovered it by preparing this presentation is that in 1968, since uh, there were some problems of advancing corrosion, uh, um, they decided to completely remove the original lead face paint. And this took 30 years of work. So they completely depainted the, the bridge and then repainted the, with advanced paintings. And you can imagine the cost of this operation. If you go uh, through the annual report uh, of the fiscal year 38, 39, so just one year after the opening of the bridge, uh, you see that the largest item in the maintenance budget is for painting of the structural steel. So more than $100,000 in 1939, which is a lot of money. And they also observed that the exposure to this type of fog, which is very rich in salts, is more severe at the Golden Gate than any other bridge in the Bay Area, not only because this fog is extremely active in attacking this paint, but also because it limits the hours when painting can be done. And I can confirm that uh, this fog is a thing there because this was the best picture I could take when I walked along the Golden Gate Bridge. So you can barely see the bridge. The last example that I'm showing to comment about uh, some comparison among different materials that can be used for bridge engineering uh, is the Ponte Azzone Visconti. So this is uh, the first bridge uh, I worked on uh, some years ago, and this is a medieval bridge. So it's a multi-arch uh, stone masonry bridge, uh, and some historians believe that the bridge uh, is the one that you see in the distance here on the Mona Lisa painting because the passage of Leonardo da Vinci was documented in the area at the time of construction. So we ran several analyses on this bridge because we had an agreement uh, with the local municipality which uh, asked us to assess uh, the seismic safety of this bridge and also the safety under static vertical loads. And we started from uh, uh, some historical research. So we were able to reconstruct uh, the, the complete history of the bridge starting from uh, uh, 1336 a uh, time at which uh, the bridge was hosting uh, an actual building uh, made of stone. And then uh, over time, uh, you see many changes, some towers, some drawbridges, uh, and then uh, this is uh, the final configuration with some arches which were, uh, let's say, which were um, constructed uh, after many years uh, since its original construction. And this is a complicated bridge because uh, it has a lot of materials inside and it was also uh, influenced by some uh, important consolidation works uh, in the 1950s because there was the need to lower the riverbed due to some hydraulic problems on the Lake Como. And uh, this comprised the introduction of some last and sheet pile, the confinement of soil beneath the foundation, uh, the, the casting place of uh, a reinforced concrete ring, uh, some injection uh, to stabilize uh, the masonry structure, and also some important work on the deck. So in particular, you see it here in this drawing, the deck uh, was interested by very important intervention. So the filling material was completely removed. And then uh, a casson, which is made of reinforced concrete, was cast in place uh, to strengthen the structure. And also there was obviously some rebars that we were able to reconstruct by going through the original documentation. And the last thing uh, that I want to point out is the presence of these uh, steel beams. So we have a series of transverse steel beams. Originally, these beams were introduced uh, at the beginning of the 20th century because on this bridge, uh, they decided to accommodate uh, a tramway. So they needed some uh, cantilever sidewalks. And the solution that was adopted was a steel solution. 
But after about 40 years, maybe something more, 40, 50 years, they needed to substitute this type of cantilever steel beams uh, due to problems of corrosion. And then again, in 2013, when we started with our inspections and so on, we actually discovered that these uh, beams uh, were again severely corroded after 50, 60 years uh, of operation. And here you see a picture in which uh, uh, it's, it's pretty clear that the level of corrosion in the web of the I-shaped beam uh, is uh, completely unacceptable. And so at the end, all these cantilever beams were removed because they didn't also comply with the original configuration of the bridge. And now the bridge is in safe condition because the, 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 less, the, the, the least safe, let's say, uh, aspect of this bridge was uh, connected to the presence of these steel elements, uh, which severely corroded, corroded over a time span of about 50 years. Okay. Now I will move to the case study. So the case study is a reinforced concrete bridge that was developed within the framework of a research project, which is a very wide one that was promoted in 2018 by Lombardy region. So Lombardy region is the most populated region in Italy, about 10 million inhabitants. And uh, we have an estimated number of bridges here, which is greater than 10,000. So in 2008, Politecnico di Milano signed an agreement on the definition of criteria and guidelines for the maintenance and management of road infrastructures. So the idea here was to have a, a kind of level zero analysis in which we can take a sample of bridges, then we can develop some classification and intervention priorities, which were based just on some documental analysis, and then provide some guidelines for management and monitoring of bridges, and also test them on some demo cases. You see here that more than 20 professors, postdocs, and PhD students of Politecnico di Milano were involved over four different departments. The nine demo cases were selected uh, out of the sample of 400 bridges uh, that we started investigating, and they are representative of the structural types and also structural materials. The bridge that I'm showing you today is this one, which is located close to Brescia. And all these results uh, will be presented uh, at the first conference uh, of the European As Association on Quality Control on Bridges and Structures, uh, which will be held uh, at the University of Padova uh, at the end of August this year, in a special session, which is dedicated to this uh, Lombardy region project. Okay, focusing on the case study, this is uh, the location of the bridge. You can see it here. It intersects uh, in an oblique way a river, so it's a river bridge, and it's uh, on the border of the municipality of Brescia, which is a rather big city in northern Italy. And you can also see here that this is a densely industrialized and also populated area. You see the very dense uh, layout of infrastructure. And the average daily traffic here on an annual basis is of about 25,000 vehicles per day. It's a multicellular reinforced concrete bridge built in the 1950s. It has a skew deck, so a rotation of the piers with respect of the longitudinal axis of, uh, of, the, of the bridge of about 30 degrees. The total length is not that significant, it's about 43 meters. So we have three spans, a central span and two lateral spans, which are cantilever spans, overhanging over a length of about 10 meters. Then the deck accommodates four main traffic lanes and two cantilever sidewalks. We also have a variable depth from 1.4 to 2.8 meters. And the deck is supported by some lead ship gearings, which I will show you in the following. We finally have two piers on the five foundation. And uh, according to our classification, that this bridge resulted in a medium high priority class. So again, since our methodology is based just on a documental analysis, uh, this means that this bridge would need a reclassification, for instance, according to novel guidelines, uh, which were promoted uh, by the Italian Ministry of Infrastructure uh, and uh, and that can be used to effectively classify according to different levels of uh, knowledge and of analysis existing bridge structures. And eventually this bridge might need also some potential intervention according to our evaluation. You see that the state of the bridge shows some corrosion at some point, but this is actually not a big deal because this is the end of this cantilever element. So it's a region which is the least stressed region of the structure. So this is a, a plus for this. 
in this case. So uh, going through the case study, we started from the analysis of the available documents. Uh, so we were able to obtain the original design report, original technical drawings, uh, some photos, uh, the inspection report, uh, and also this bridge was inspected uh, in the past 10 years. Uh, so you see that we fall in this category that we consider inside this approach of Regione Lombardia of the first uh, level of completeness. So it means that we have uh, a good amount of information about this structure. But just, uh, please notice here, uh, notice this, out of about the 300 bridges, uh, we have uh, just 20% of bridges in which uh, we know something. And we know something about the original design, we have some technical drawings and also a recent inspection. 56% of the cases show old inspections or recent inspections with no documentation. And we also have about 20% of bridges of which we don't know anything. Okay, so this is very complicated when you need to face a structure of this kind. Um, on this bridge, uh, we um, conducted a series uh, of uh, experiments uh, in the framework of a very wide diagnostic campaign. This is just partial and it's illustri illustrative uh, because we had some uh, limited budgets. And so we had to consider a limited number of specimens, for instance, for, instance, for the coding. But we conducted a full laser scanner survey, a photogrammetric survey, ambient vibration test uh, to assess the dynamic uh, behavior of the structure, then some concrete coring, carbon test, radar scans, direct or indirect sonic, sonic and ultrasonic pulse velocity tests, rebound hammer test, and measurements of the exposed rebars. And here you see some pictures. And this is the bearing that I mentioned before, which is just a sequence of lead sheets between the two steel plates. From uh, the um, laser scanner and from the general geometrical survey, we obtained uh, some information about the bridge. And we also discovered uh, here that the original design differs from the as built. So you see that if you count uh, the five, the, the transverse cells of this deck, uh, you have only five in the as built, but in the original design, we had six. And we discovered that in many assessments of the safety of the bridge, uh, they actually consider this uh, situation even though it was pretty clear just by taking a look here at these, uh, these elements which were used for ventilation and also the removal of the formworks uh, that we might expect uh, just uh, five cells of this multicellular structure. And according to the orthophotogrammetric analysis, we were also able to reconstruct, uh, as you can see here, the existing cracking pattern. And this helped us uh, in understanding and in choosing the optimal position for uh, the transducers that I will show you in the following. We run a lot of uh, analysis on this bridge, uh, also in terms of mechanical characterization of concrete. So concrete coring, carbon test, and again, a sonic uh, uh, direct pulse velocity test, uh, and also the SONREB approach, which combines the two. What I like uh, to highlight here is that we discovered that the carbonation depth is significant, at least on the piers. So we have about 60 millimeters. Uh, and it's not compatible with the concrete cover, which in this case is limited because it's a bridge from the 1950s. Plus, uh, we obtain some strengths, uh, and uh, according to the strength evolution formulation, which are proposed by the model code 2010, uh, we were also able to estimate uh, the strength at the time of construction and compare these uh, with typical strength uh, of concretes uh, in 1955 uh, in Northern Italy, which were collected uh, by the Politecnico di Torino. The radar scans allowed us to investigate the structure, to understand uh, and to check the thicknesses of the structural components and also to uh, highlight the presence of reinforcement uh, by checking uh, the original drawings, uh, understanding whether the arrangement and the distribution of reinforcement is compatible with the original drawing. These were very useful, but in some cases, uh, Obviously, you should pay attention in estimating the, the presence of reinforcement with this technique, uh, because you can also have uh, some uh, biased results uh, due to the presence of some inclusions and also some shadows of the signal. On this bridge, uh, since this bridge is a pilot case uh, and it's a case study, we also introduced a monitoring system, which was installed, uh, let's say, about six months ago. So we have several instruments, not that many, because again, we had some budget limitations, but we instrumented the two ends of the bridge, monitoring the vertical displacements, 
plus uh, a series uh, of uh, transducers, uh, which uh, in this case uh, are some uh, deformometers uh, with a potentiometer wide transducer, were placed uh, astride of the existing track to monitor the track opening uh, over time. We also have some tilt mirrors, uh, which measure, measure rotation. And finally, we have some temperature sensors, uh, weather station, uh, and uh, an hydrometer and one digital camera that control uh, uh, effects uh, of uh, water or effects combined uh, with, the, with the flux of the river. These are some pictures uh, of the installing phase. So you see that we needed to use climbers uh, to, to install our instruments. Uh, and this is uh, a deformometer which monitors uh, the track opening uh, stride a series of existing tracks. Here you see a contact uh, um, surface temperature transducer plus uh, one of the transducers that were placed uh, at the end, so on the abutment of the bridge. And I will show you here that this particular configuration is of great interest, let's say, because uh, according to this configuration, we were able to fix the base on the abutment uh, which uh, is considered or may be assumed uh, as uh, a fixed, uh, let's say, uh, a fixed point, okay, with zero displacement, uh, while the head of these transducers was anchored uh, to the bridge itself. So according to the cantilever behavior of this bridge, uh, we were able to measure the net displacement uh, of uh, the bridge deck uh, under several loads. So this type of bridge is subjected to some uh, variable loads uh, due to the traffic uh, due to the traffic, let's say, plus uh, some uh, environmental loads, for instance, the radiation uh, of, of the sun, so the solar radiation and the variations of temperature. And uh, I reported here just an example of 10 days. Uh, these are the last 10 days of November 2020, in which you see the responses of these transducers. And you see that they uh, exhibit uh, two components, uh, two main components, uh, one slow varying uh, behavior, which is associated to temperature changes, and some other alterations which are characterized by a higher frequency, which are associated to uh, the traffic insisting on the bridge. So this is pretty clear if you also correlate uh, this measure with the temperature measurements that show also some variations which are very significant, uh, even though this was uh, the last uh, part of November. Uh, we then uh, uh, decided to run a moving average here, identifying only the behavior due to the environmental condition. And then by difference, uh, we finally obtained uh, the displacement, uh, which is just due to the presence uh, of these variable loads. So it's a traffic induced displacement of the bridge. And from here, you can clearly see that on Saturdays and Sundays, uh, you see uh, smaller displacements because the traffic levels uh, are much smaller. So under traffic loads, the vertical displacement range between plus one and minus two millimeters. We also add some uh, tilt meters here that will eventually allow us to reconstruct uh, the, the overall uh, deformed shape of the bridge uh, and also the deformed shape of the piers, according to also some uh, hydraulic events or after some uh, hydraulic events. And we finally took the chance to record and monitor also the passage of a heavy goods vehicle, uh, which was uh, transporting a massive transformer. So this was a train of two four axle trucks uh, and two 13 axle trailers. Uh, the global weight of this uh, transportation was 380 tons uh, over 76 meters of length and a total of 34 axles. So since uh, this um, transportation was scheduled, uh, we managed to install the system before the passage of this truck, uh, and we were able to record uh, the response of the system. So you can see here again uh, an analysis of the displacements at the end of these two cantilever elements, uh, in which you see a first uh, uh, combination, which is called phase A, which maximizes the load on the central span. And uh, on the right, uh, you see preliminary numerical models, which were uh, produced and which were constructed by calibrating. Uh, the numerical model on the diagnostic campaign data and also on the ambient vibration tests. And we were able to get uh, um, reasonably well, uh, let's say, the displacement that we recording, recorded during the passage of this truck. Then uh, we imposed a second combination, so a different combination which maximizes the load on the two lateral spans, uh, keeping the central one uh, roughly unloaded. And you see here, 
downward displacement of the ends and negative uh, curvature of the deck. Again, here, good agreement between the, the preliminary numerical model and the recorded uh, displacements. What is interesting to observe is that under this HGV load, the vertical displacement range between the same limits that we saw before. So the behavior of the bridge under such a significant load is roughly the same in terms of maximum displacement um, that the behavior of the behavior, let's say that we recorded in average traffic conditions. So this means that the distribution over 34 axles of this very massive load was very effective because at the end we didn't cause any, any damage to the structure and we also were able to go back, uh, you can see here, to the original uh, displacements of all the, the, the transducers that we took into account. So on this bridge, we can conclude that we carried out a series of investigation of a 70-year-old reinforced concrete bridge, which is still operating on a heavy traffic network. It's important to review historical documents to reconstruct the history of the bridge and understand uh, also how we can optimize the field operations. Then uh, despite the age, which uh, of course exceeds the original design life, uh, this bridge appears uh, to uh, sufficiently perform uh, in standard operating condition. But we observed uh, several degradation phenomena that should be investigated as, as I told you, the, the carbonation uh, of concrete, which might lead and accelerate uh, to a fast corrosion of embedded steel reinforcement. Last point, uh, we suggested uh, to uh, operate on leaking joints, faulty drainage system, uh, and low concrete covers uh, with some techniques uh, in order to decelerate future degradation of this structure. I will conclude now with just uh, one slide on uh, final remarks. Uh, so um, to summarize everything, so palaces or prisons, uh, I would say that the answer is uh, maintenance again. And I reported another small sentence from that paper by Ricardo Morandi, in which he said, I think that sooner or later, maybe in a few years, it will be necessary to resort to a treatment consisting of the removal of all the traces of rust on the exposure of the reinforcements, to fill the patches with epoxidic type resins, and finally to cover everything up. So we had in mind the different technology, but this is basically what we are doing nowadays with fabric reinforcement tissues mortars in which we cover up the structure and we try to preserve uh, what's behind uh, this layer of high performance concrete. But what we don't know exactly is whether this solution uh, can effectively stop uh, the progress of degradation or to which extent uh, this degradation can be decelerated, let's say. And also we don't know exactly, and we should work uh, a lot on this subject, uh, which are the effects uh, on the overall ductility of the structure when we include uh, some high performance composites like FRC ends. But uh, what we should be in mind is that concrete uh, is still uh, quite a live material because we, we must uh, keep in mind uh, that it has a role uh, on both uh, new construction and structural retrofitting. So uh, as regards the new construction, I just reported two cases, the Butterfly Bridge by Akio Kasuga, FID president, and the Pont de la République by Rudy Ricciotti in France. These are two cases in which uh, ultra high performance materials were used, uh, and you can see that it's possible to get very significant uh, technological and architectural expression by using this kind of composites. And also, Again, uh, one of the advantage or possible advantage of innovative materials, which are cement based, uh, is to be able uh, to ensure and to extend, uh, let's say, the service life uh, of existing concrete structures. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Julia, for this uh, presentation. Really clear and also really interesting. A lot of history about our construction, I mean, bridge history and traditions. Okay, so now uh, it's time for questions. So if you have any kind of question or curiosity, or just you want to discuss a bit with Julia, you can type your question in the chat and then we will, uh, he will answer to all of your uh, questions or curiosity. Uh, meanwhile, I have some um, just curiosity about these bridges because actually after 70 years, the condition of the bridge was quite good. So yes. this is mainly because the environmental condition probably is not aggressive at all in your region. Yes, 
it's uh, it's due to the context for sure because uh, actually uh, it's not that aggressive but even though i think maybe the, one of the main advantages of this bridge if i can go back uh, very fast to the scheme is also the original conception of the bridge because the idea of having uh, the structural joints uh, at the end of those, uh, let's say, overhanging spans uh, is that you can actually concentrate a lot of damage uh, in some parts of the structure which are not that significant in terms of structural capacity. And so what happened here probably was that uh, um, even though the details and the detailing and the maintenance of the structure was not sufficient, uh, I would say, uh, damage just localized in some portions uh, which are not that significant. And also one quality of these is that is a very redundant structure because it has a kind of uh, drillage tech uh, with two orders. So it's a redundant scheme. It has a lot of redistribution capacities. Uh, and this is also something that ensures uh, a good behavior in terms of external loads. So we will analyze it in with more depth. Uh, also with reference, uh, what it's actually worrying us the most uh, is the carbonation problem that we discovered uh, at some point. And also in some cases, the piers uh, have some filling materials inside that, that we discovered during the coring. But overall, it's, it's in good shape and good condition. So it will just require uh, revamping, let's say, so the substitution of the concrete covers and then uh, cleaning the deteriorated reinforcements. Okay. And in this project, I mean, this is a very huge project that yes. uh, involves a lot of bridges. Uh, have you observed any kind of cover effects? So soil erosion below just one pile that compromises the bridge? Okay, yes, we selected some bridges. Uh, we have one uh, on uh, River Po, in which uh, we also had some lowering uh, of the riverbed. And this is something physiological for River Po at some points. Uh, and so it's a bridge on which you actually see uh, the piles of the foundation uh, and it looks like it's something, you know, considered since the beginning, but actually it's an alteration of the level of the riverbed. So it's something uh, um, that we included because also in this framework, uh, I had a limited amount of time, but this type of approach, uh, as I told you, is a, is a project uh, focusing on the documental analysis, uh, but also includes uh, some vulnerability analysis and also the impact of the closure of the bridge on the overall network. So we also have the Department of Management because we estimated also the implication on the transportation of goods and people of the closure of the bridge on the overall regional network. And we also have inside that group of 20 professors, postdocs, et cetera, also uh, some experts uh, in uh, hydraulic. So they developed actually the vulnerability part uh, of this uh, expeditive evaluation procedure in which we consider the shape of the bridge and also the context in terms of uh, river systems. Interesting, okay, thank you. Okay, I don't see any other questions in the chat. I don't know, probably you were too much clear, so <laughs> there are no doubts about what you uh, showed us. So, okay. So, I want to thank you again, Julio, for your time and for thank your. Thank you uh, for inviting uh, me. Yes. And before um, leaving you and closing the webinar, I want just to tell you that we will have another webinar on the twenty uh, third on the so the twelfth of May about FRCM systems uh, that are also always. Um, used as a retrofit solution for reinforced concrete structures. So just follow us and our news on the website or on our socials, just to stay tuned uh, to follow on our activities. Thank you very much again and have you a nice evening. Have a nice Thank day. you, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you for the presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.